Well, kia ora tato, everybody. Uh, Bruce Arrell again, Director of the Goodfellow Unit. Welcome back to the last of our webinars today. And we're very privileged to have Indran Ra uh, Ramanathan with us, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon at the Green Lane um, Cardiothoracic Surgical Unit, now based in Auckland Hospital and also in private practice at Mercy Hospital. And he's going to talk about no sweat, treating hyperhidrosis and facial blushing. Over to you, sir. Uh, no trouble. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. And uh, okay, so as you said, we're just going to talk about uh, treating hyperhidrosis and facial blushing. And it, it is something which we probably don't um, uh, hear about much uh, throughout medical school and even in postgraduate uh, sort of education. Uh, but it is a very common problem, and it is something that you know we see time to time. And I think it is something that is probably um, uh, that, we, that we do uh, that it's underdone in. Um, medical treatment of things. I think there is some, there are some treatments to offer and we'll have a run through that and uh, tell you all about it. So, I mean, hyperhidrosis um, is exactly what it, what it states. It just means that there's more sweating than what is required for normal thermoregulation. And obviously this results in, in embarrassment in social circumstances at work um, and even can result in emotional issues uh, where patients are upset by the degree of sweating that they have. And obviously that's a big deal for them and uh, it's clearly something which requires um, some sort of treatment. If you do look in the literature and the textbook about it, there's not a great deal, uh, but they do divide it into primary and secondary hyperhidrosis. This talk is really about primary hyperhidrosis. You really don't need to talk about secondary hyperhidrosis. It's just something that is, physiolog is physiological or excessive, but still there's a stimulus for it. Just touch on that light. So in terms, uh, and what I say about primary hyperhidrosis also is, is uh, very similar to facial blushing. It's very similar uh, epidemiology and etiology, very similar treatment. Uh, so look, discuss those in, tan in tandem. And both these comments are, both these problems are very common. I mean, they occur in about one to three percent of the population, which is actually quite a large number of people. People are un uncommonly reported to their GP. Um, it is something which whatever reason, people don't think there's uh, much medical help for it. Of people who do report it, 90% of it is primary. Um, a third of it say, says it's severe and it's barely tolerable. Um, and so that, if 3% of the population have it, and a third say it's barely tolerable, then one in 100 people have barely tolerable hyperhidrosis, uh, which is a large number of people. And interestingly enough, uh, there's a family history of uh, hyperhidrosis, and often we'll see both brothers sitting in the waiting room see uh, actually occasionally you see like the mum or the dad and, and, and the kids as well. So it's, a, it's an unusual thing but it is, uh, it is certainly very common. Uh, like I said primary hyperhidrosis is um, the majority of it is 90% is idiopathic so we don't really have a cause to it. It's uh, almost always bilateral and symmetrical um, and, it, and it involves all the places where you normally sweat. Cilla, your palms, face and the soul. Secondary hyperhidrosis is not really a diagnosis and really a, a symptom of something else which is much more uh, obvious and it's not like uh, we need to distinguish them because uh, the other issues of cardiac failure, respiratory failure, and thyroid dysfunction really could be the main presenting problem. Just touch on that quickly. Um, there are a few medications which can cause secondary hyperhidrosis. This is like antidepressants, hyperglycemics when the blood sugar goes down, and selective estrogen receptor modulators, things like tamoxifen, uh, as well as Viagra. Most of those medications can't really be changed. If patients are stuck with uh, hyperhidrosis, secondary to these medication, that would, that would still require um, some sort of intervention. So in terms of the pathophysiology and what causes uh, hyperhidrosis and facial blushing, it really boils down to overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. As you remember, I mean, you've got the nervous system, and you've got the uh, somatic nervous system, which is your voluntary, and you have your involuntary, which is your autonomic uh, nervous system or your automatic nervous system. That's divided into parasympathetic and sympathetic. The sympathetic arm of that, uh, which causes hypnosis uh, through excessive um, In terms of the glands themselves, the sweat glands are actually normal, but they are hyperfunctional. There's a higher basal level of sweat production, they have increased response to normal stimuli. So, normal stresses. See if some people sweat a little bit, but physical exertion or heat or whatever, 
or a little bit of emotional stress, you see tremendous sweating in patients with high fiber. Again, that mechanism has been has been uh, elucidated to be increased in sympathetic nervous system activity. There are some um, uh, experimental studies which show the evidence for that. Interestingly, these patients do have normal catecholamine levels, so it's not it is something that is mediated through the spinal cord and outflow of sympathetic activity through the spinal cord rather than from adrenal glands. So the adrenal glands produce catecholamines and normal catecholamines, normal adrenal glands, sympathetic activity. From the, uh, from through the spinal cord and to through the nervous system. Indran, we're just having yes. trouble with the audio. Could you maybe lean in towards your microphone a little bit more? Yeah, sure. And just try sure. and keep still. That that sounds yep. a lot better. Is that better? All right. Wait, wait, wait. Right. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So, so yeah, I was just saying that there's increased sympathetic nervous system activity, uh, and that's um, uh, through the sympathetic trunk and through the spinal cord rather than through the adrenal glands. Uh, and that's because these patients have normal catecholamine levels. It does touch on the medication that we give them um, and uh, uh, and mechanism of how, how we do that. We'll have a quick look at that in a second. Um, looking at uh, this slide, just to remind you how tough it is at medical school, if you do remember that there's the sympathetic nervous system is here, and uh, I'll just use my mouse pointer. Um, the outflow is in the chest. Largely, there's a small amount that comes out for, out of the lumbar spinal cord, but it, it forms a sympathetic trunk and it gives a sympathetic outflow to the skin from the entire body through the chest. So that's why a cardiothoracic surgeon is talking to you about uh, about facial blushing and uh, and hyperhidrosis because uh, where that outflow is is through the chest. If we do something here locally, if we divide these, we can reduce that sympathetic outflow and reduce facial blushing and, and sweating. Uh, this is just another quick look at it, basically, with the spinal cord here, um, those sympathetic fibres uh, pass through into the sympathetic ganglion, and then they'll go out to the sweat glands as well as to blood vessels or whatever. Um, and if you look on the, on the right, you can see this, uh, this yellow structure with the, with the bulbous um, parts on it where the ganglia, that's your thoracic sympathetic trunk. Um, and, and importantly, although the outflow is from the spinal cord, the sympathetic uh, fibres travel upwards to the face, uh, as well as out to the arms of the brachial plexus, as well as through the chest wall. So division here at the appropriate level, we'll see that um, sympathetic nerve, nervous uh, um, activity is reduced uh, to whatever region you like, and so it will uh, reduce swelling there. Uh, this is a thoracoscopic view inside the chest. This is what you will see at the operation. And you can see that there's these are the ribs here, there's a rib here. You can see this structure here. That's a sympathetic chain that runs down. Bit of lung that's been pushed out of the way, um, and we can, we can easily divide that. This is an accessory nerve called the pinch nerve, and that's there in some people, and you just have to watch that and divide that as well. Uh, if you're doing a sympathectomy to treat this problem, um, actually, when the when the fibres reach the skin, uh, they they get to the sweat glands, and that um, that mechanism of action is is by acetylcholine. So anticholinergic medications will work um, at this level. So uh, it's again just to understand the, uh, and there's a duct here, so just to understand what uh, some of the medical treatments are. So, if, uh, so what, what we basically just uh, learned so far, just a quick recap, is basically this is a very common problem. It affects one to three percent of the people, and it's severe in many people, and it's all because of sympathetic nervous system overactivity, which leads to sweating. That is excessive, uh, um, at least as some sort of impairment. The people are, uh, the patients are, um, are embarrassed by it, or they think it's impairing their ability to have a normal life. Uh, so when, when we look at the assessment of it, we don't really need to do any tests. You just need to understand from it how bad is it for you, what sort of treatment level do you need. Um, if they're having a lot of difficulty with it, then we can uh, then we can um, uh, tailor treatment uh, for them. It depends on exactly how, how severe it is. So in terms of treatment, you know, we've got three levels of treatment. One is a topical antiperspirants. Uh, then we have uh, medic medical treatment and then a microscopic sympathectomy. Um, uh, and, and then the similar that, so you've got topical medication, basically oral medication, then a surgical approach. There's a couple of other things around botulinum toxin, um, that's Botox, it can be injected into the palms and into the axilla. 
uh, and it can and, and it will produce uh, a reduction in sweating. Um, this unfortunately isn't uh, funded in neither the public or private sector by the health funds. It is a, it is a, a little bit expensive, I suppose. And the main issue with that is it only lasts about four months, maybe five months, um, and the thing will need to be repeated. Patients will need multiple, multiple treatments over many, many years, especially if they're young. It might not be a feasible solution for them. The other thing I just want to touch on is there is something in the literature called iontophoresis, which um, is uh, basically passing a current uh, through the skin, and basically the hands or the feet would be soaked in uh, in a in a bathtub, in a, in a tub rather, and a small electrical current is passed through that. That may or may not include a medication, and the results of this vary widely. Um, you can have some papers which will say it does very well. In some papers, results are works in less than 2% of people. Um, again, it's not funded, it's not available widely. Patients have to buy it themselves. Um, and, and so these two things, I'm not really going to talk about any further, although it's in the um, spectrum of, of what people will find when they uh, research those uh, treatment modalities. In terms of topical solution, like you said, we, uh, like I said previously, the go-to thing is an antiperspirant. Uh, occasionally, you get a patient you will say, yeah, I'm taking antiperspirant, it's not working. Um, and you just have to check with them whether it's not a, a deodorant. Um, so all the persp antiperspirants will have some aluminium uh, compound within it. Um, the strongest one is this dry core, which is a 20% aluminium chloride. Uh, the aluminium bonds with uh, mucopolysaccharide actually blocks the duct. Um, it's, uh, it's applied on at night and then you wash, wash it off in the morning. It's very important that um, it's applied to dry skin because uh, it can react with water to form hydrochloric acid and obviously cause uh, irritation. It's um, variably tolerated. Um, some people will have a, a good response, and uh, a fair number of people will find it irritating um, to their skin. A fair number will um, find the clients of it not so uh, uh, feasible, and especially with young patients for a long, long time time ahead of them, it may or may not be useful. Patients who don't have that much sweating will tolerate this very well. In terms of medication, as we said, that uh, the, when the nerve gets to the sweat gland, it's a massive alcoline mediated um, uh, release of uh, sweat. So if we use anticholinergics, that should work well. Um, it is, in fact, a uh, off label use of these medications. There's no randomized trials. Uh, it does cause side effects, um, and it shouldn't be used in patients who have simple urinary retention or constipation or glaucoma. Um, and in young patients, obviously, there's not a, not a risk. Um, some people, there's an article out there which says there's some dementia risk with this as well. Uh, so it has to be used with some caution and, and probably can't be used for a long time. Uh, people will talk about beta blockers and benzodiazepines, and that's more for, for episodic uh, hyperhidrosis. So if someone has a specific stressful situations they come into uh, and they can prepare by taking propanolol beforehand, um, then, then that's useful. I'm not sure if, um, if uh, benzodiazepines should be prescribed uh, for this anymore given the um, trouble that uh, lots of people have with it. So then, then we come to the, the surg surgical aspects of it. And basically what this is is a thoracoscopic uh, sympathectomy. So this that's to divide the sympathetic chain at the appropriate levels uh, to produce Reduce sympathetic outflow to the area. It's a, it's a, of all the treatments, it's the most effective, but it's also the most invasive. Um, it is a single port procedure, so we only have to make an incision that's about maybe one, one and a half centimetres long on either side. It can be done day stay, although you know, it's uh, funded in public and private for patients to stay a night or two, so um, available. Um, the main risk of this is that it can be, well, I suppose it can be ineffective in five to ten percent of people. Um, very, very rarely uh, you can get injury to the stellate ganglion. Now that's if you go, basically if you get the level wrong, and instead of uh, making an ablation on the second rib or third rib, you do on the first rib. Now that's hard to do, but uh, if, if uh, it has been reported, if you make that ablation too high, then um, you get a Horner syndrome. Uh, and the main problem with that is ptosis, and the patients will not be that. It is very rare, I think it's probably less than one percent. Now, all uh, medication, all, all, everything that treats uh, uh, sweating and reduces sweating 
will result in compensatory sweating elsewhere if, um, if it's required for thermoregulation. So some patients might experience more sweating in another area, but um, turn to that something which is in the literature, which I haven't really um, experienced too much. Uh, most of the patients are extremely happy. And uh, when I, I asked them specifically, do you sweat somewhere else? And even with leading questions, they don't seem to be troubled with it. This, this is the instrument that's used. I just thought I'd show you this. So this is a thoracoscope. Oh, we just pass this into the chest to make a small incision. The camera actually head is attached to this so that you can see light is attached to here. You can pass a, an instrument down there to do the um, disinfecting or the regulation. It's a very poor picture, I'm sorry, but this is the um, diathermy tip here. This is where we've done two ablations, the third and fourth uh, intercostal spaces where we divided the sympathetic chain, which you can just see through there. This is this is the incision in a young lady. Um, we've only made it probably a bit of centimetre, centimetre and a half. This is a month post-operatively, and it's uh, healed very well, and obviously it's just medically very satisfactory. Just, I just thought we'd just run through a couple of cases here. Uh, this is a 46-year-old lady who I saw who had uh, significant facial blushing. It was very easily triggered. Interestingly, it wasn't uh, homogenous. She just didn't go bright red. She had this sort of splotches of redness. Um, it said it occurred for most days. It was a nuisance. She felt uncomfortable. Um, perhaps she had some, she was a bit anxious about it, but she certainly didn't have anxiety disorder or any uh, psychological or psychiatric issues. Um, and it was something, but it was something that troubled her significantly. Again, if you look at the general treatment for this, what people would suggest is do conservative measures first to introduce anxiety and avoid triggers. Uh, I think you'd be fairly brave to tell a woman to, to wear makeup to, to solve this. I'm not sure if that's a health thing. I'll tell you in the literature as well. Um, but I suppose if it helps some people, then that's um, non-invasive uh, treatment. Or in terms of the medications, she was actually tried on, on beta blockers uh, for quite some time. Uh, she, she didn't find that very successful. So she, she came forward for a sympathectomy, a form of sympathectomy on her. And one of the most remarkable things about this operation is the effect is instantaneous. You go back and see them in the, in the PACU, the post anesthesia care unit, and uh, she, she wasn't red. She wasn't red at all, and she looked uh, really great. She had a fantastic result. She was very, very happy with it. And, um, uh, so, and then we do anything further uh, for her, obviously. She looks a bit sharp there. This is a young lady who's uh, 17, and she's otherwise well. Intran, could you just, yep. just uh, try coming closer again? Oh, sorry, sorry. You. Sorry yep. about that. Hey, so, I've got, got a young 17 year old uh, girl here who, um, otherwise well, she's had severe axillary and palmar sweating. It's occurred for many years. Um, she basically wears dark colours, she dries her hands off and um, she doesn't lift her arms up if she can avoid it um, and she dries her hands very often. It's not stress related, so it's not episodic, it doesn't just come and go, it's there all the time. Uh, she really liked to work as a flight attendant and wanted something done. Um, so uh, dry claw was prescribed, um, that was really, it wasn't effective enough for her. Um, so uh, we went on, we, medications were discussed. Given her age of 17, and she's got a long way ahead of her, um, we decided that probably we weren't going to try any medications. And she was, we discussed the risks and benefits of a, a sympathectomy for her. And, uh, and again, she's come forward, she's had that, and she's had an excellent result um, without any, uh, and she's probably had a, a few more levels done. She's had the auxiliary levels done plus the palmar levels done. And I was a little bit concerned about um, compensatory sweating, but she hasn't had any. And, uh, and again, she's had a very, very, very good. Uh, this is it. It's just had palmar hyperhidrosis. It's uh, incredibly severe. You find it hard to write and impaired his work. Uh, he had sweat dripping from his hands, basically. He had already tried antiperspirants uh, the time he was sent, sent along. So basically, we, we um, uh, tried some oxybutynin as well as propanolol. Propanol um, and uh, again, that was ineffective, and he had a lot of side effects. Um, especially with dry mouth and speaking, and I think he, he went for sales as well. 
So um, that was uh, discontinued and uh, he went forward for a syndectomy. Uh, the thing I remember about this case was uh, in the PACU, he was rubbing his hands together. He just couldn't believe how dry his, heart, his hands were. And uh, again, he had a very, very good result. And um, like it's a very satisfying and pleasing operation to do, to be able to do. Um, just as a you know, quick summary of what we've discussed here, um, look, this is a very common problem. Treatment is actually very simple and very straightforward. Uh, all patients who have hyperhidrosis, first thing to try is an aluminium based antiperspirant. Um, medication can be tried if you think it's appropriate, either just the oxybutynin or the um, or propanolol. Uh, and that can be tried, and if that's successful, that's, that's fine. If either of those don't work, then I think sympathectomy should be offered. It's a very safe, it's effective, it's minimally invasive. Uh, but importantly, if you think that you know, that someone is young, like that 17-year-old uh, girl, or um, as a, you know, is unable to tolerate or comply with the other medications, uh, we can make a significant impact to them uh, by offering this surgery earlier. So it doesn't have to be a last resort. I think it's very, very effective for them. Something that's very simple and straightforward uh, for us to do. So, uh, thank you. I hope you, I hope you have some uh, questions. here in run I think um, uh, one one really good suggestion I don't know if you're familiar with the Auckland Regional Health Pathways but actually it would be quite good to have some of this uh, this stuff on it um, okay. I can are you are you familiar with them I could look, um, I, look, I, I, I am sure. I think I think we, I think we uh, I have seen them and look that, that that's a very good good suggestion I'll I'll, uh, I'll see what we can yeah. do I think you're going to be a very busy man. Um, I think you have to give, give up the chest and uh, give up the coronary bypass and start looking at this. Um, um, somebody said no more sweat products can be effective. Are you any thought about that? Oh, look, yes. I mean, I mean that's probably an aluminium uh, chloride-based uh, antiperspirant. Um, and uh, yeah, look, and that'll, that'll be effective in some people. Yeah. And it's, it's about the degree of sweating that people have. Um, and, and that's absolutely right. So yeah, so try those things first. And, uh, and I've just, I've just learned a good, a new diagnosis, gustatory sweating. Right. Any look, comments on that? Yeah, look, I've never heard the term it. before. Yeah, gustatory sweating is obviously sweating related to, to eating food. Um, it's normal if you're eating like spicy food that butter chicken is too hot for you or something. But um, uh, but it uh, is often related to um, uh, it can be related to procedures on the face. It's actually more common with parotidectomy and after parotidectomy uh, for some reason. Patients may get it uh, following um, a sympathectomy. It's, it's, again, it's a very uncommon and it's not something which has ever happened to me, which, which I'm grateful for, but it, it is a potential thing that you could have sweating after after you eat. Might be that uh, normally patients sweat elsewhere, that they'd sweat through their hands or they sweat through their armpits, unable to do, so, do that, so they might feel that they're sweating more on the face when they eat or on their scalp. Um, uh, and that's again, the, the sweat has to go somewhere, the heat has to come out somewhere. Good. Just keep close to the screen there, uh, Andran. You're yeah. much clearer when sure. you come closer. Uh, sure. What surgeries are available in public? Oh, look, look uh, sympathectomy is definitely available in public. Um, it, it, uh, yeah, it depends on exactly uh, which pathway you go through. But if you referred it to me in public, that that would be fine. Uh, not all of my colleagues in uh, in the Auckland Hospital do it. And it might not be available up and down the country, so you just have to check exactly where you are on, on whether it's available or not. So we're happy to see them in Auckland, obviously. I mean, it sounds like the cases you operate on are pretty debilitated. I mean, you they, know, they it are. would be no fun having this, this condition at all. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I mean, you know, uh, we see them in the waiting room and uh, free COVID, you shake the hand and go, yeah, we need to do an operation. Simple. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so no, nothing more than that. <laughs> so you think the only diagnostic test is a handshake? Yeah, and if you see, and patients sometimes will stand up, wipe their hands, and then shake your hand. And I think you've got to say okay. to them, hey, 
how bad is that uh, sweating? Especially young boys, uh, they always do that. They sort of get up, they'll, they'll wipe their hands on their jeans and they'll shake your hand. And um, is, so, hey, are you? Carry on, yeah. Oh, no, so it is something that we probably um, take the opportunities to identify and say, oh, look, hey, I just noticed that you, you've got sweaty hands. You know, does that trouble you? You're worried by it. And, and some of them would say, look, yeah, no. And some of them would say, yes, I think it's a trouble. And, and uh, we could offer them a treatment for the topical uh, uh, mm. antiperspirant so that they can apply to their hands or, uh, or medication or an operation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, somebody was trying to hunt down glycopyrrolate without success. Yes. Any suggestions yes. for that? Look, uh, look it's uh, it's not really available in New Zealand. Um, the one that's available is the oxybutynin. Uh, glycopyrrolate isn't really available. Hmm. Um, any long-term complications of sympathectomy? Uh, just that occasionally, like the ptosis will be long-term. If you do get a ptosis, you'll need to have ocular plastic surgery to fix it, right? There's nothing nothing more that mm. can be done. So it's something that's definitely avoided and great care is taken to identify the correct level. Um, so um, so, um, so that, that's the that's probably the worst complication, I think. The uh, compensatory treating, I uh, don't think, sorry? You carry on, yeah. Oh, no, no, just the, the compensatory treating, I don't think is a, is a big issue. Um, occasionally you can get like I said, you can get a unilateral response where one side's better than the other, and that will tend to persist as well uh, into, into the long term. So they're, they're the main issues, but there's no there's no um, uh, effect beyond that because the sympathetic outflow to the rest of the body is maintained just because of the anatomy of the sympathetic nervous system. Is there any place for sort of damping down the sympathetic nervous system with getting people physically fit and learning things like mindfulness um because we sometimes put the heart rate yeah. variability measures on people and you can slow does is that is that a reasonable approach yeah look i look i think so i mean if if uh, if people uh, try that and it works then, then that's great i mean they don't need to have anything and that's that's great and that that'd be more with uh treating anxiety and treating um, uh, episodic mm. uh, sweating that's related to an event or stress yeah. or then, then that, that would definitely be useful question here how long to go try the dry claw for before you give up how long yeah, you try it uh, i probably i think you you'd know pretty early you probably just need to try it for a few months so two or three months uh would be enough mm. and a surgical question here do you have to go down both sides for sympathectomy Yes, we do. So basically, a um, patient will come in, we'll have general anaesthetic, uh, we'll make an incision on one side, have a look, do that side, um, and then uh, put a little uh, drain in, and then reinflate the lung, pull the drain out at the time of operation, then, then close the wound, and put some local anaesthetic in there, swing around to the other side, and uh, make the incision, put the scope in, and do, it, do, do that side as well. And it is a very uh, sort of it's a quick procedure, it'll probably take maybe 45 minutes, something like that, 30 minutes, 45 minutes to do both sides. It's a very straightforward, very simple procedure. Do both lungs collapse, do you say? Yes, yeah, so we'll use a double lumen tube, we'll collapse yeah. one lung to have a look, and then um, uh, we'll reinflate that lung and make sure that lung's inflated. Uh, then we'll, the chest drain will be placed through that wound just so that we can uh, get the lung up fully, uh, and then chest strain is removed at that time if you haven't done anything to the lung mm. and, uh, then, and then we'll close up that wound. Yes, you seem very relaxed about collapsing people's lungs. The, the thought terrifies me. But <laughs> <laughs> you, you, live, you live in a different world of risk, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, if, patient, if, if patients want ionophoresis, is there enough evidence oh. to recommend it or will it be a waste yeah. of money? I don't know. It's just like, look, I mean, uh, there's papers out there you, you can get which say um, they have a fantastic result. Um, if someone, you know, uh, wants to, um, uh, they'll have to spend their own money to, to get it because it's not funded by the health system in any way. Um, you know, if, if they wanted to do that because they're, uh, they don't want the other, the other treatments that are available, and I suppose it's up to them. The uh, literature is very, very um, heterogeneous on the results. 
some some are very good mm. and some are very poor. Um, it, it might be that it, uh, it uh, you know may not be that effective beyond placebo. Maybe yeah. Mm. Is it expensive? I think the machine is several thousand dollars, and uh, yeah. and it's also and you need to uh, do um, multiple treatments throughout the week. So you might do second daily treatments throughout the week, and uh, and over time you may be able to reduce that. Um, there is a suggestion that initially you just put your hands in water and the electrical current pass through. If it doesn't, medication may be added mm. to that to that water, and then uh, that might help that mm. through the skin. Uh, but yeah, it's um, it's, uh, it's a little bit variable. But but botulinum toxin does work. Um, it's just the fact that it only works for you know, five months. The whole process needs to be mm. repeated. It's about two thousand dollars of treatment, so. Um, it's uh, it's fairly uh, expensive. Is is the uh, Botox covered by um, medical insurance? Do you know? I don't think it is actually. I don't think it is. No. Mm, there'd be a bit of rush on that, wouldn't it? Just pop it here yeah. as well. <laughs> oh, actually, actually and, and the, the other issue with Botox is it does affect uh, some of the, the muscle function as well, and that's why you can get a facelift out of it. Um, and you can mm. have actually. Uh, Grip strength is can be slightly reduced by it when it's used in the palm, so it is something just to think right. about as well. Right. Um, clonidine. It's uh, one of the yeah. uh, question that says being used for flushing and hyperhidrosis. Yeah. I mean, uh, clonidine. Uh, again, it's, it's an off-label use. It's, um, it, it's one of those funny things where it is actually an alpha blocker. So you'd think that it would cause more vasodilatation and reduce your blood pressure mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and make that worse, but I think it's supposed to act centrally as well and reduce um, some central uh, sympathetic outflow. Uh, so look, I mean, uh, clonidine would be useful as well. Um, it is off-label. There's probably more um, postural hypotension with clonidine than with propanolol. Uh, but clonidine uh, certainly uh, could be tried again in an off-label mm. manner. Um, so a financial question here: What's the cost of sympathectomy in private sector? Oh, look, it, it, it's all fully covered by all the health funds. So if you if you if you're funded, um, it shouldn't cost you anything. Right. Okay. What about if people have to pay for it themselves? If they have, what if what they sort have of to order? Oh, look, I'm 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 not sure, but because it'd be a day in hospital and a few things like that, it'd probably be about it'd probably be ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Okay. I guess if it's that bad, you probably would be willing to pay that, wouldn't you? Yeah, if you can yeah, you may do up, that. Up the money. Yeah. Any role for a beta three agonist, Mirabagron? I don't I know. Is that the question? That's a short answer, but I don't know. Yeah. I haven't uh, I haven't come across that one. No. Um. So dry claw is available in New Zealand, as far as dry you know. Definitely, yes, dry claw is definitely available in New Zealand, yeah. and um, yeah. that's probably. Want to use, but actually, uh, if patients can get um, any uh, aluminium based antiperspirant that's sort of extra strength or whatever, that'll be pretty close to dry claw, and they could try that. Um, yeah. and, and if it settles down, that's great. If they just need a little bit more, then you could try that dry claw. Um, and yep. yeah, and that'll be my feeling. Uh, um, and any publicly funded um, sympathectomy outside of Auckland? Do you know of people outside of Auckland doing it? I think I think it's available in Christchurch, as far as I know. Um, I think it would be available in Hamilton. Um, I'm not sure yep. if it's available in Wellington, and I don't think it's available in Dunedin. Yeah. So you told us how long it takes, about 45 minutes. What percentage yes. of people get problems post-surgery? Oh, look, I suppose, I mean, could have a small um, pneumothorax or something post surgery. Uh, it's very uncommon uh, to do that. You would not need any drains or anything. This is something that you don't have an issue with the lung. The lung will just reinflate slowly. Um, again, this is it's very uncommon to have a, a significant problem. Even wound infection is very uncommon. Um, mm. And uh, other surgical issues like bleeding or whatever is also very, very uncommon. It's actually um, it's a very safe operation. What's the frequency and dose of propanolol trial? Yeah, look, uh, it'll be ten milligrams, and because it's a, you know, it's a, it's one of the older ones, um, it should be taken before a, um, 
a stressing event. So if you're going to go to, to work, you take it before work or whatever, it is relatively short acting. Um, so you might take it uh, a day or whatever, uh, but yeah, it'd be a 10 milligram of those. And the oxybutynin would be just five milligrams a day. Right. Right. An interesting question. Can I call out the sexism inherent in the societal expectation that women not sweat? I don't know if that's your field or... Um, oh, uh, actually, actually, for the sweating, it's the boys that come in with sweating. I don't know why. Um, it's, it's mainly boys and uh, there's occasional... There's some girls who will come in, but uh, my patients tend to be males, actually. And I've only had, the, I've only had um, maybe... I think one man who's coming with, with facial blushing, so maybe that might be um, that might be uh, something there with the, with the blushing. Right, right. Um, any concern about aluminium-based antiperspirants and cancer? I know there's a bit of a concern about dementia, but yeah. any with cancer? Uh, I'm not too sure about that, but it is topical, so it should just it should just go into the skin. Um, as far as I, I I don't know actually if uh, so I suppose these things. The issue with all of these things is that the patients who come are, as you can see, most of them are young. They're probably in their early 20s most of the time. They need to be taking this thing for a long, long time uh, because their dad's probably had it, their brothers have it. Um, it will take a long time. They will need to take this for a long time. So um, I suppose that has to be taken into account as well. How long do you want to have someone on oxybutynin? How long do you want to have someone on propanolol? Um, if, if it is a severe problem, I think they should be are referred for uh, sympathectomy. Yeah. Um, uh, the sympathectomy, is it a permanent solution or is it a regeneration of the nerves? No, it, it's a permanent solution. It, it's, um, yeah, yeah. it's absolutely permanent. So, yeah, you'll, you'll basically, uh, yeah, it won't grow back, uh, um, it won't sort of get less uh, over time, it, it will stay at that level um, for a long time, right. forever. And uh, is there a chest drain put in after the sympathectomy procedure? Yeah, look, like initially, I think people used to put a chest drain in on, on both sides, but uh, over time, we've sort of developed this thing where we don't need to do it. And uh, like I said, we just re-expand the lung, uh, drain all the air out of the chest um, and, and, and remove it all, all in the operating theatre so that there's no, no drain. So the patients just wake up and uh, we put a lot of local anaesthetic around the place. They actually wake up pretty pain free and they're pretty good and we just keep an eye on them and um, mm. do it generally in the morning and if they're well afternoon or the evening um, you know we get them home if they're out of town we keep them overnight but um, yeah and if, if you specifically want to stay overnight then you can but um, otherwise otherwise you can go um how long the conservative treatment including botox before referring to someone like yourself um, I, I think it kind of depends on, on how bad the, the, um, the sweating is. Um, if, if it is very bad and you've tried a couple of things, then you know, over a three or six month period, you've, you've tried a few things, then I think that you know, that's fine um, and you can um, please refer them on. But if, if it's a mild sort of thing and uh, you've tried one or two things and the patients are sort of, if they're happy with it, then uh, you could persist with a bit, for, for a bit longer maybe 12 months or something and say, oh, look, this is actually uh, slowly getting better or whatever, then um, it's just a bit longer. But certainly we see people who uh, have had a long history of sweating and uh, we've tried these, uh, these um, topical and oral medications and after about, uh, and in that period of three to six months, we sort of decide, look, you need to have an operation. I'll either put them on a waiting list in uh, public or uh, go ahead uh, try and check that. So if you, you're getting a referral in public, it would go through the cardiothoracic surgical unit, would it? Is that would be, yes, correct. Yes, would be how correct. you do it? You don't yes, refer correct. to somebody else and they refer it on to you. Okay. No, no, a comment about no, probanthine no. was very effective, not available anymore. Um, I can't even remember what probanthine was used yeah, for. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's an anticholinergic, actually. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's an anticholinergic, and, uh, and the oxybutin would be the, the other thing to use. Um, question about um, aluminium and breast cancer. I think you probably answered that sort of before. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, uh, dry claw is not available via prescription. Is that true? Is it over the counter? Yes, it is. It is over the counter. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think you can prescribe it. 
Are there any aluminium antiperspirants subsidised on prescription? As far as I know, I don't think so. No. Right. And any comment on aluminium-based antiperspirants in younger ages, say 13 yeah. to 15 year olds? Uh, I, I would use the um, the over-the-counter ones, um, but I would probably uh, use the ones which have lower uh, concentrations in the dry core. Um, there might be ones which have uh, five or ten percent or whatever. Um, I'd, I'd definitely start with that first, um, yep. and uh, and limit the application. Uh, the thing with it in those young kids is that it has to be applied to dry skin, um, and it's more of a problem with the higher doses of aluminium chloride, um, and uh, because it, it, the skin irritation is caused by uh, actually becoming acidic and uh, irritating the skin. So should be applied to dry skin, um, probably with a lower dose first, washed off in the morning, and uh, that, that would be useful for younger, younger kids. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I think we're coming to the end of the questions there, uh, Andran. Any, oh, there's one comment about um, fluoxetine has been right. recommended by some people off-label for flushing, even though you mentioned it as a cause. Any yes. comment on that? Um, I think, uh, yeah, that's right. It's one of these things which it's off-label use. We don't have randomised trials. We don't have even trial data, uh, whether it's, it's beneficial or not. Um, I, I wouldn't be rushing to it um, because I think that, um, uh, especially with the downside risks, Someone an any person if, if their emotional state is normal, it, um, you know, I wouldn't be. Uh, I don't think I'd be advocating it. Right. right. Um, think question here about risk of pneumothorax with um, the surgical procedure. There is a small risk. It's probably it's only it's only a few percent. What that is really is just air left behind after we've done the operation, and. What that right. could be is it could just be a very small amount of air, like a centimetre at the top of the chest. Um, if, if after the operation we do a chest x-ray, uh, these patients are often young and they're fit and uh, they don't have an issue with their lungs. So there's no burst uh, apical pulmo or something which can cause an ongoing air leak. Um, and the pneumothorax won't get worse, it'll just get better slowly over time. So even if they did, did have it, um, they wouldn't require a chest strain. So a chest strain would not be. Um, question here about somebody who personally had quite bad sweaty hands <clears throat> as a young person. Oh. Writing was terrible, and yes. uh, now a GP, maybe being a GP is good for sweaty hands. Not noticeable right. anymore in the last 20 years. Is it normal to improve without treatment in young people? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, from, from my experience, I mean, especially when the dad brings in the sons, and I said, yeah, I had this. But you know, I still sort of got it, but it is it is a bit better, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, some people will get better, but sometimes it doesn't. Uh, yeah, and that's just for the luck of the draw, sort of thing. But uh, yeah, I think that more often than not, it will take a long time uh, for that to slowly get better. And so, it's like ten years of having sweaty hands in your twenties, it's probably not ideal. What, what what would be the mechanism of that? Is the sympathetic nervous system wearing out as you get older, or what? Um... Yeah, it, it might be. It might be, or its response to stress, and over time you sort of uh, develop a different stress response. You're not as worried about yeah. things, or, or whatever, or your thermoregulation is better, or mm. whatever. Um, well, yeah. you know, over time, yeah. But, well, um, anxiety you... certainly peaks in twenty-year-olds. You know, it's much less yeah. in older people. Um, yeah, right. uh, if they've had the the chest strain. The other issues with them for diving using snorkel um, scuba diving. Uh, look, afterwards. actually, no, there, there isn't. They can they can do whatever they like. Um, if obviously yep. after the operation they had a small pneumothorax, you have to wait for that to resolve. Uh, but we, we would get yep. a chest X-ray for them, and uh, we'd never put a chest chest strain in again in patients. Um, yep. I think only only one or two might have a tiny sliver of air on the chest X-ray. Um, you talk about using antiperspirant overnight, then washed off. Do they apply it during the day as well? Uh, no, the recommendation is to have it at night. Um, 
and that's uh, I'm not sure why they say that. I suppose that you can get a good a good level of of any first print cover, and basically the mechanism there is to just block the sweat glands over time. Um, and so I suppose it doesn't matter when it's applied, but it just needs to be applied for, for several hours. Applying it during the day won't reduce the sweating during the day uh, because the treatment is to, to plug the sweat glands with this polysaccharide complex that's formed with the aluminium. Um, so, um, yeah, so it's got no, no effect to of course, reduce the sweating. Um, uh, yeah. um, if the sweating's on the hands and soles of the feet, um, can yeah. you use the dry claw there? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So, yeah, you, you can put it. You can put it wherever wherever you have sweating. Yeah. Any thoughts on the highest dose of oxybutynin um, for a hyperhidrosis? Yeah. Look, I mean, I think that probably you start with five. You might get to ten. By the time you're getting to ten or uh, patients will, will definitely be complaining of a dry mouth and, and uh, maybe even constipation and things like that. Yeah. Um, it is a very blunt uh, medication, um, block um, anticholinergic, as it were. Uh, but yeah, you, I mean, you could try probably five and um, perhaps ten, but um, I, I think uh, most likely run into side effects at that ten. Um, in terms of the sympathectomy for blushing and sweating, is it at the same level? It's not actually. The, the, um, the, the facial blushing we tend to make that ablation on the second and third ribs, so the second and third sort of ganglia down. Um, for the for the for the axilla, it's uh, the third and fourth, and for the palm, it's the fourth and fifth. Um, so if you have more than one of those things, you might do the axilla and palms. You might do three, four, and five. Personal question here: What's your complication rate? <laughs> Actually, it's been very good, and I, I really, I really like this operation because, um, actually, it, it's been very good. The patients are tremendously, tremendously satisfied, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, I don't I, I want to touch wood because we haven't had any uh, for for a while. It is, it is a very safe and effective operation. So I hope that the next few go well too. But um, yeah, look, um, so in all honesty, we've had never needed to put a chest strain in, never needed to reoperate on anybody. No one's complained of hyperhidrosis, uh, compensatory sweating. Um, and uh, look, maybe we could offer our people right at the end of their tether to uh, really like the uh, results that they've had. Um, but yeah, look, it's been, it's been very successful, and that's why I thought it's something that we need to, to share because it's something that I find uh, tremendously satisfying. We do all sorts of big operations and all sorts of people. But uh, I really love seeing these people in vacuum, uh, especially when they're rubbing their hands and it's so immediate, uh, the amount that uh, I've been able to help them. Well, it's like in primary care, getting the wax out of people's ears and trimming their corns. They're hugely <laughs> grateful for. Um, and yeah, I've seen absolutely. people very, very, very unhappy about having their chests open, so I can, I can relate right. to that. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, is isotane, uh, isotretinoin, and the acne drug, in, uh, in this yeah. regards, re its dry skin, does it reduce sweat gland activity? Any? It, it, it would actually. It would. Yeah. It would. Yeah. Yeah. It would. It's, but, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and last question: thoughts on low-level light therapy, e.g., photobiomodulation or near-infrared laser therapy. I've not heard of either of them, so. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think that might be the same sort of thing as the ontophoresis. It might work for some people. Um, mm. What I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get across, I suppose, is that um, we've actually got a very good sympathectomy, a very, very good operation that works really well, widely available. Um, and I think that uh, um, we can treat everybody with it who has a problem. Um, mm. And it's well proven, you know what I mean? So we have a proven treatment that works well, low mm. side effects. Um, yeah, I think uh, instead of asking patients to buy something for um, uh, do something which we're not entirely too sure works, mm. I think it would be quite good to recommend that. So I'd just like to thank you for um, presenting today and thank the audience. So um, we've had our Absolutely. record sign up ever. Okay, well, thank you very much, Bruce. And thank you, everybody. That was um, so great to be able to present this to everybody. Thank you. Okay.